selfie-ish guy, if that makes sense. Uh, I rarely see a, a selfie from you. Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm sure it's not my first one, but it's, uh, it felt like it just not. I didn't know what to do with my finger. I was like, do I press the thing now? Like, yeah, it's weird. Let me, okay, cool. We are live on YouTube for anyone that's watching there as well. Uh, so we're going there and guys, we are going to get this thing rolling. So the topic of our webinar today is metabolic conditioning principles and progressions. I know we've met a lot of you before, either on past webinars or perhaps in CCP, but just a quick intro. We have Carl Hardwick here, who's going to be, you know, kind of leading up this discussion. He is OPEC CEO and an instructor of the coaching certificate program. And I am Georgia Smith. I am a coaching advisor here at OPEX and uh, play a role in our education as well. So glad to see some familiar faces and excited to meet some new people today. Uh, let's get let's get right into it though, guys. Uh, we got a lot to get through. So, first of all, to give you a little bit of insight into what our agenda is for the day, I'm already skipping ahead on slides as I love to do. First up, we're going to hit a little bit of why do metabolic conditioning because I think it's important that we set the tone of why we're doing this thing so that we're not doing it just because we saw Metcons looked pretty cool on Instagram. We got to have a reason for it. We're going to introduce a couple of frameworks, so our patterns and pacing progression, and then also our four C's progression to help you guys figure out how to design Metcons most effectively. We're going to do a little bit of a walkthrough of some avatars and ask you guys to help us pick the best Metcons for some, uh, for some folks. And then we will have some time for Q&A at the end. And we do also have a special offer coming to you. So make sure you stick around uh, for the full hour so you get to take advantage of that. Let's get right into our why do metabolic conditioning though. Carl, uh, ready to take it? Yeah, for sure. Um, I know we didn't really define uh, metabolic conditioning. I think it's important to have a conversation around what it is and uh, the language that we use or don't use around it. Uh, quite frankly, we don't really use the term metabolic conditioning inside of our program or internally at OPEX. We do use it when we talk about, you know, these uh, pushing out these public webinars just so people understand uh, what we're going to be discussing based on their definition of metabolic conditioning. But metabolic conditioning in my head is just anything that conditions the metabolic system, right? So that's resistance training, that's walking upstairs, that's doing a math six session, all of that in some way is a metabolic conditioning session. So just so we all understand what we're talking about, we're talking about uh, doing pacing work, aerobic work, sustainable work. And then we'll talk about some, some ideas of doing unsustainable work as well, because that also is metabolic conditioning. But for purposes of today, we're heavily, uh, biasly going to talk about um, aerobic work or sustainable work. Um, so the first piece is carryover, right? If aerobic work and understanding how to go about those bouts of work has a lot of carryover to other aspects of life. Uh, we learn patience, we learn uh, how to be sustainable, and inversely, we learn how being unsustainable can have negative impacts on exercise, life, so on and so forth. And it gives us a really good metabolic challenge. Um, in terms of, you know, getting away from physiology, we'll talk about that in a second, but in terms of like emotion and what it can, what it can bring to us. I, I do think that um, aerobic work brings a great level of confidence in one's ability to do work. Um, and that's, 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 that's obvious if I'm like, okay, you see the session written out for you, you have to go into the gym and do it. But because we're talking about carryover, um, just because I was actually thinking about this this past week, we had our staff retreat in, in Idaho and uh, my kids were with me and my younger one jumped in the lake one day and he didn't have a life jacket on and that kid really he can't swim he's four right so he, he does this for like a second and then he's going down and that was a pretty deep lake right so I'm thinking in my head like oh my gosh like he's five feet away from the boat I have to jump off of this boat I have to grab him I have to like not drown myself and kill us both and I have to go back to the boat it's like did I have the confidence to do that work without thinking about it yes I did Right. So it gives us the confidence. Obviously, you have to have the ability to do those things. Don't think that you can like build a robust aerobic system and not know how to swim and jump into a lake and be OK. I'm not saying that, but it gives us confidence to do things uh, without thinking about them. That's one example. Another example is, you know, uh, I have to park, you know, 
400 meters away from the door at Costco. Do I have the confidence to do that in the sweltering Arizona heat and walk 400 meters, be okay, and then walk back out with my shopping cart or my 100 boxes in my hand and be okay and not think twice about it, right? The ability to do bouts of work, sustainable work, sets us up really nicely for just normal life, normal day-to-day -day activities. Next is fuel utilization. So because we are, we are, we are challenging the metabolic system, like we mentioned above, um, aerobic work allows us to flirt with unsustainable activity and learn when we are being aerobic, i.e. sustaining, versus anaerobic, not sustaining. So it, it kind of gives us that opportunity to flirt with that and understand what is sustainable versus what is not sustainable. So when Georgia mentioned like, oh yeah, I saw you doing like, you know, some cyclical work today. It's like, yeah, I kind of flirted with that a little bit today where it was like, ooh, if I hold this pace on the bike erg or that pace on the ski erg, I'm flirting with unsustainable activity, right? So it's always like that challenge of like finding what is sustainable for me in that moment today. Uh, not looking at, you know, what's my, what's my 20 minute pace or anything like that, because that stuff is a good like framework, but it doesn't actually matter when you're doing work because you may feel differently today than you did yesterday and, and differently than you did when you tested that 20 minute pace. In terms of actual fuel utilization, like what are we using when we do work, any kind of work? We're using ATP, we're using CP, we're using glucose, et cetera. All of those relative to what we're talking about in aerobic work are fueled by the presence of oxygen while avoiding the overproduction of lactate. And I'm gonna say most of the time, right? Because we can think of, we can all think of uh, some sustainable aerobic work where we had some really localized uh, burning of muscle tissue or localized muscle fatigue, right? That's hydrogen being produced and lactate buffering that hydrogen out, right? So we could say by definition, up, oh, there's lactate present, so that's unsustainable work, but I'm not saying that because lactate is always present. But again, remember what we said, we're kind of flirting with like sustainable and unsustainable when we're pushing threshold a little bit. So it gives us that opportunity to utilize all of those fuel sources appropriately. And appropriately just means in appropriate ratios based on what you're trying to achieve in that specific session. Metabolic conditioning scenarios allow us to coordinate the muscle, the heart, and the lungs. So when we look at this thing physiologically, it gives us the ability to actually utilize those things that you've already worked on, right? So let's break them down. Muscle, right? We're not talking about muscle and, and all of that today, uh, but it's important, right? So muscle, the adaptations in the muscle tissue are already done through your pattern or your resistance work. So we'll get into that a little bit in the frameworks, but You've already you've already gained those 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 um, those capabilities to utilize muscle tissue, heart, aerobic work done to effectively push blood to the muscle and to the extremities. Right, that's what our heart does in this whole thing. And then finally, lungs. Our aerobic work done to learn to breathe and ensure efficiency is occurring in the former processes. Efficiency in the muscle. Efficiency in the heart. So three, three main things that we're thinking about there, muscle, heart, and lungs. We can get more specific and we can talk about like the neurological system. We can think about blood specifically, but uh, those are the big three that, that we talk about. And then finally, we can look at longevity benefits that come from metabolic conditioning or aerobic work, weight management and metabolic efficiency. We can talk about um, promoting a healthy cardiovascular system, right? So you know, directly correlated with lower risks of cardiovascular diseases. Um, again, a, a, a healthy metabolic system that has nothing to do with weight management, right? Metabolic and, and, and uh, metabolic as well as hormonal systems in terms of all of those things locked and loaded and, and, and uh, just moving through life very, very effectively. It promotes outstanding levels of skeletal health in conjunction with aerobic or resistance training, sorry. And then finally, it also pr promotes great levels of immune health, right? And those are all just correlations of, okay, weight management, metabolic efficiencies, uh, healthy cardiovascular system, healthy metabolic system, all of those things are pushing to having a more robust immune system. 
and that immune system working more effectively. Carl, I appreciate you taking the time to walk through those because I do think it's incredibly valuable for fitness coaches to be able to communicate the why behind what they're prescribing to the clients that they're working with. And while it's awesome to understand the physiology and like we can kind of geek out on the fuel utilization pieces, like that's not the stuff that matters so much to clients. Uh, I think in communication, connecting the carryover to daily activity and those longevity benefits and, you know, when appropriate, having a little bit of a deeper conversation around some physiology for the right client can be beneficial, but just some really good nuggets in there for coaches that are looking to better communicate the benefits of doing metabolic conditioning to their clients. So some good notes to take down guys, uh, maybe in the replay, if you didn't take them down, then we're going to uh, move it on to our first framework of designing Metcons, which is our patterns and pacing progression. I want to say the two P's, but we're not going to call it the two P's. We're going to call it patterns and pacing. But Carl, could you walk us through a little bit of what we're seeing in this uh, pretty graphic on the screen? Uh, yeah, definitely. So we're going to walk through two frameworks today. Um, and this framework sets us nice, sets us up nicely for, for the next one. So we'll kind of bounce back and forth in, in ideas. Um, but the intention with the patterns and in, in pacing progression is to learn to make simple work sustainable before adding complexity in load, contraction type, et cetera. Right. So we're going from a very non-complex idea of cyclical work all the way to a very complex idea and implementation of cyclical plus gymnastics plus weight. So just really quickly, I'll just kind of walk through each one of these and give, uh, you know, very simple real life examples, trying to make like the time domains and all of that very similar. Um, so for cyclical, think about uh, prescribing to yourself or one of your clients a 500 meter row, rest two minutes, and you're going to do that times eight sets. That's a cyclical session. So that's what you're doing. You're doing cyclical activity. So let's say that you're doing cyclical sessions for eight, 12, 24 weeks, however long where you're like, okay, I nailed my pacing in cyclical work across a broad, broad spectrum of time. So if I said, okay, go row for 30 minutes. And I said, Hey, go row for 30 seconds. You know, your paces, you know, your gears, all of that. So you've gone through that progression. Now you're working to mix cyclical activities. So now complexity is a little bit higher because remember, uh, it's not always about the complexity of contractions, but it's different types of contractions that are occurring. And we have to make those contractions aerobic, i.e. sustainable. So an example here is one minute row, one minute ski, rest two minutes times eight sets. So very similar to the first one in terms of time domain, we're still working for two minutes. We're still having, we still have uh, 16 total minutes of work inside of it. But you can see the complexity is now a little bit higher because now we're contracting uh, the bend, the pull, uh, the push, all of that inside of uh, this one piece. So you're getting off the row or you're going to the skier and now you're engaging an entirely different musculature and you're learning across those eight sets how to make that sustainable and aerobic. So now we go to cyclical plus gymnastics. So an idea here is each set four times, you're going to go 15 calories on the rower. You're going to go 12 box jumps and you're going to go nine pull-ups. You're going to rest two minutes and you're going to do that for eight sets. So that's an idea of cyclical plus gymnastics. Gymnastics being box jumps and pull-ups. Cyclical being the 15 calorie row. Now, finally, to the most complex idea uh, inside of this progression is cyclical plus gymnastics plus weights. So now we're going to go each set four time at sustained 15 calorie row, 12 dumbbell deadlifts, and nine ring push ups. So again, cyclical is the 15 calorie row, gymnastics is the nine ring push ups, and weights, we're doing dumbbell deadlifts. And the idea here, guys, is that we now have to coordinate different levels of tension, we have to coordinate different patterns of movement. And we have to make all of this work sustainable. The reason why we have this framework is so you guys as coaches don't just onboard a client. You're like, well, yeah, I saw this like 2159 thing uh, on a website. I'm just going to give that to you. And then you see your client do that. Uh, let's say you have two clients that do it, one with a vast amount of experience and they do it in four minutes. 
And then you have another client that does it and it takes them 14 minutes. And then you look at the quality of movement inside of it. You look at the metabolic effects or non-effects because there's the, the complexity is a little bit too high inside of that 21, 15, nine, so on and so forth. And you have to think in your head like, oh man, should client B have actually gotten that work? Or should I have given them something that falls more in that four minute range? Because that's what I wanted it to feel like. I wanted it to feel like client A. So think about what you're giving their your clients, what they can make sustainable and what they're capable of performing based on what the outcome you want to be from that exercise session. We have uh, this arrow down the bottom, Carl, with pattern progression that is continuing all the way through from cyclical up to cyclical plus gymnastics plus weights. What is happening in pattern progression? Just very briefly. Yeah. So pattern progression, just look at that as like an underlying, like that's, that's always happening in the background and that's in resistance training. So pattern progression, we want people to be able to squat effectively. And then I'll talk about what effectively is here in a second, but squat effectively, bend effectively, lunge, push, pull, core, all that stuff. Like we want people to be able to do those things effectively before we make the decision to put them in a metabolic conditioning scenario. I.e., I think an easy one for everyone to understand is someone can't do an air squat effectively at a slow tempo in an assessment uh, atmosphere. Would you put that inside of a cyclical plus gymnastics piece? No, that just sounds dumb, right? They can't even perform the movement. So pattern progression has to occur at the bottom before you can check that box and be like, okay, yeah, I can put the air squat in that cyclical plus gymnastics piece. If you're not putting an air squat in a cyclical plus gymnastics piece, are you putting a front squat in a cyclical plus gymnastics plus weight piece? No, it's like, it's a lot to wrap your head around and it seems fairly complex, but it's not. It's like once someone gets here in pattern progression, boom, put that inside of their metabolic conditioning piece or their aerobic piece. We've got just a couple questions in the chat box that I'd like to hit before we move on, Carl. So, uh, we have been asked by Arash, is there a specific reason behind doing cyclical work before body weight activities? Yeah, definitely. It's, it's about turnover, right? So when we, look at, um, when we look at aerobic work, aerobic work is about maintaining a, a specific cadence, rhythm, and turnover without muscular fatigue holding us back. So think about, I'll just use the air squat example, but let's say someone's capable of doing air squats. We have a 20 minute piece, it's air squats and push ups, And the goal is to increase the aerobic system. It's air squats and push ups, or it's a salt bike. For most people, you're going to go with a salt bike because rhythm, consistency, tempo, all of that will be higher, heart rate, all of that without the presence of localized muscle fatigue. And the 20 minute AMRAP with push ups and, uh, did I say sit ups? push-ups and sit-ups, whatever, whatever those things are, push-ups and sit-ups or push-ups and squats. You might get someone that's like, oh my gosh, let's say it's 10, 10 for 20 minutes. By the end of it, they're like, okay, I'm breaking my push-ups into two because I'm just totally fatigued. They're wearing like a heart rate monitor and their heart rate monitor says 115. And you're like, oh man, I wanted to get that to like 140, 150. I wanted to get some sweat going, but they're held back by localized muscle fatigue. In a cyclical scenario, it's a better it's a better atmosphere, especially for novices, to become more aerobic and to learn their gears. And then just one more, and guys, we will have time at the end for Q and A, so we'll make sure we get to other questions there. Uh, but Carl, just to wrap up this slide, Sandy had asked if it would be possible to repeat your first statement of definition of pacing progression. So could you reiterate pacing progression one more time? Um. In terms of the intention, I think is probably yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the intention is that we learn to make uh, more simple work sustainable before adding complexity and load, uh, contraction type, etc. So it's we're we're we have simple work that we're making sustainable before we add complexity to it. And then that uh, push up air squat example is an idea. Those aren't two very complex movements but they can become too complex over a 20 minute time period if we're putting those back to back because there's things inside of us, inside of those that are going to hold us back. 
Perfect. Thanks, Carl. So guys, we're going to move on. We're going to play a little bit of a game and have a little bit of a quiz to follow up. Um, just a quick reminder that we are sending out a recording because quite a few people asked that question. So I want to make sure everyone is clear on that. So guys, you've seen from left to right here, our four steps of this uh, progression or framework laid out. Let's move on to our little pop quiz. And I am going to play a video uh, to show you guys this workout. And then I'm going to ask you each question. So don't jump the gun and be answering the question before I've even asked it. So let's go ahead and watch uh, a little bit of this 10 minute AMRAP of eight push ups, eight box jump step downs, and an eight cal assault bike. So we've got Jacob here doing some push ups. I'm going to skip ahead. And then we're going to see that he is doing some box jumps here. Looking good, Jacob. He finishes up those box jumps and then he heads over to that assault bike. He's working nice and sustainably on that assault bike. He finishes up his eight calories and then he's back to his push up. So, again, a circuit style AM wrap here. So, guys, question number one What step of the patterns and pacing progression is this Metcon? So, you just saw those four steps laid out. What step is this? I'm liking what I see, guys. So third step, cyclical and gymnastics based on that exercise selection. We have our push-ups and our box jumps, box jump step down, which are gymnastics activities. And then we have the assault bike, which is a cyclical activity there. So guys, uh, good work. Everyone got it right. I didn't see any wrong answers. Did you, Carl? Nope, all good. Awesome. Okay, question two. Which movement patterns need to be developed in isolation before they're introduced to this cyclical and gymnastics circuit. So guys, think about those gymnastics movements, especially what movement patterns. Keep them rolling in. I'm seeing some good answers here, guys. So a lot of people identifying the push up, which would fit into our push pattern and then the squat. So uh, that, box jump step down is primarily a squatting movement pattern now that is occurring there. All right, guys, let's move on to uh, pop quiz number two. So here we are. We have five rounds for time. Again, Jacob demoing of 20 double unders, 10 toaster bar and a 10 calorie row. So we're going to watch a little bit of him uh, hitting this Metcon here. And again, I'm kind of kind of skip ahead. So he's doing some double unders here. Oh, he tripped. And again, he tripped. He's not very good at double unders, guys. So let's uh, assume he got through those uh, 20 double unders. And now he's moving on to his toe to bar here. All right, two reps. He's back down. He broke them up again. So guys, those 10 reps, he's breaking. It's taking a while to get through them. And then he's heading over to that rower. We'll watch him do a couple strokes on the row before we pause it. So guys, I can see you are already going ahead in the chat box, pointing out what might be wrong with the execution of this Metcon. Uh, but anyone else, question one, what is wrong with the execution of this Metcon? I'm seeing a lot of too complex movements, skills haven't been developed, not ideal exercise selection for him would also be, uh, be appropriate to advanced, not sufficient techniques. Guys, those are all appropriate answers there. Anything to add, Carl? No, it's, it's funny watching this, right? Like in this scenario, we're like kind of poking fun a little bit outside of uh, Jacob shoe selection. Um, those are, those are not cuts guys, inside joke. <laughs> and, um, but they're not good. Um, but no, we're all laughing about it. Like, oh, this is crazy. Why would you give people this? Walk into a lot of gyms around the world and you see this shit, right? Like you see people that are like doing work like this. And, you know, in this scenario, what we'll see is we'll see that person go super hard on that 10 cal row. Um, at the end of five, five rounds, it'll probably take Jacob, what, 15 minutes to get through this. At the end of those five rounds, it'll be like a challenging metabolic bout because he just went so hard on that 10 cal row and he'll get up and be like, that was a great workout, right? Not talking about Jacob specifically, but we see that all the time. 
uh, that this is, it's funny when you, when you see it on the screen in this like educational scenario, but it's actually happening. Um, so I, I, I just, I just want, I want people to understand like, and, and I know that you guys are seeing it as well, but the shit happens. Sometimes we live in little bubbles where we're like, oh no, that's lower order exercise selection, blah, blah, blah. But that that's happening. Guys, what would be a better prescription? If you had five rounds for time of three exercises, just throw something out in the chat box. And I know you don't have Jacob's assessment data and you don't know his capabilities closely, but just drawing some assumptions based on what we've discussed. I'm seeing single unders and sit-ups and then the row, which is great. Possibly need an elbow if he has the skill there and he's developed that. Yeah, just less complex gymnastics exercises would all be uh, all be good options. But again, ultimately, it's going to come down to the individual. And it's very hard to just give a blanket prescription without actually having seen him move and knowing what he has developed there. And it looks silly and, you know, he's probably going to get the wrong dose from doing this workout, but you may also run into issues where, you know, that toe to bar, he's compensating, he's running into issues where he may end up, you know, just swinging a little too big and overextending that back or causing a little issue at the shoulder. So there are real reasons not to do this work outside of, you know, just getting the incorrect dose response. And it is why it is very important to make sure those movements are developed in isolation before we put them in a metcon like this all right guys thanks for playing let's uh let's move on to our second framework so we have our four c's progression now i'm gonna pass it back to you carl to talk us through the four c's yeah, nice transition i would tell i would tell jacob uh just to stick with cyclical here i was like yeah let's do some cyclical work obviously it, it depends on what his goals are and so on and so forth but um, yeah, I mean, if it was like, oh, I just want to improve my metabolic conditioning, I'd be like, okay, so let's do row intervals or bike intervals or something like that. Um, gosh, we have some good questions here. I don't want to stop our progress. Let's get through the next few and then guys just save those questions to the end. Um, all right, I'll roll through this one pretty quickly. Uh, so with the four C's progression, the intention here is to give a framework of progression once you leave cyclical and mixed cyclical work. If you want to leave cyclical and mixed cyclical work, and I'll, I'll, I'll get back to that here in a second, but it's important to understand uh, what you are using based on your client's capabilities and where they are in the patterns and progression framework, i.e. it's all good to stick with cyclical modalities for the rest of someone's life, if that's what, if they're okay with that, right? It's, it's okay. You don't have to go from the rower to the push-ups to the pull-ups and all that. If your clients, you know, just love that shit and like, they're like, I, I, I like it and that's what I want to do. And I enjoy that type of fitness. Awesome. I like that type of fitness as well, but we have to ensure that our clients have, are capable of, of doing that stuff and getting what Georgia called dose response, the appropriate dose response from that work. Um, it's all good to not move past gymnastics. It's all good if weights are very low, complex uh, exercise selections, i.e. farmer's carries and stuff like that. Like we don't have to power clean and jerk and snatch and do dumbbell, sexy dumbbell, single arm stuff and, and all of that. Um, I know it's probably not the best coming from me because I really enjoy that kind of work. But just because I enjoy that doesn't mean that every client that I've ever worked with has to also enjoy that. And it has to be in their exercise programming. Um, again, complexity increases as you move to the right of this image here on the screen. So let's talk about what's occurring, what's occurring in each one of these pieces. Devin, I'll get to that in a, in a second here. Uh, what's occurring in each one of these pieces, right? In circuit formats, just think about, um, think about a, a 10 minute AMRAP and you're going from exercise A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C. It's just a circuit, right? So pacing is important. Transitions are important. Rhythm is important. What you're doing to allow pacing transitions and rhythm to occur in terms of exercise selection is extremely important. And you'll see that all the time as well. I think Georgia might have something there, but you'll see that quite often as well, where someone's trying to do a circuit and they're like resting 14 seconds before going to the next thing. And they have so much muscle fatigue that they have to break the push-ups into 16th set and all of that. That wouldn't be a circuit. 
So with circuit, we're looking at pacing, transitions, and rhythm, a really nice rhythm occurring. And we get into a very deep in CCP, but we also have to think about what our pace is that we're going at. If you're working for 10 minutes, what pace do you attack that circuit at? You should probably attack it at a pace that you can sustain for a lot more than 10 minutes. Next, we have a chipper. So what we're thinking about in chippers is we're thinking about localized muscle fatigue is likely occurring in a chipper format. So we're doing a lot of work and then we're going to a next, next amount of work, next amount of work. So think about uh, 100 air squats and then an 80 calorie row and then 60 burpees and then 40 box jumps. You get where I'm going. You're knocking out a lot of work over and over and over. So localized muscle fatigue may be a limiter. Heart and lung challenges due to high tension could also be a limiter there. So remember we walked through muscle, uh, heart and lung. So because tension might be high in doing a hundred reps, like air squat tensions, squat tension might be high for someone in air squats, right? So because that tension is so high, heart and lung, the heart and the lungs are challenged. Now for a load for a hundred reps in a front rack, you can kind of just ima imagine how that changes in terms of what we would want to see in a circuit format versus a chipper. And then finally, in constant variance, variation in contractions, uh, the inability to find rhythm and flow like you're able to do in a circuit format are some things that occur here. What is constant variance? Constant variance is just you're just doing a bunch of uh, random ordered pieces. So think about you have four sets of an, aer an aerobic bout, right? So it's, let's say it's four times. Uh, 10 wall balls, 10 burpees, 10 kettlebell swings, 50 double unders. And it's A, B, C, D. And then you're going E, C, A, B. And then you're changing it every time so your body doesn't have an opportunity to get into that flow. And contractions are so varied. It's like the double unders felt great at the end of the piece, but they didn't feel great when they came right after the wall balls. Right? So it just gives your body an opportunity to adapt to something a lot different. All right, guys, we're uh, going to move on from that progression. And again, do a little bit of a pop quiz here with Metcon number three. Last one, uh, we got Jacob demonstrating. So this is an eight minute AMRAP, uh, i.e. a circuit. 15 strict pull-ups, 10 wall walks, 30 wall balls. Let's watch a little bit of it. And then I'm going to ask you guys what uh, what might be going on and what, what might be wrong with this prescription. What is wrong with it? <laughs> so we've sped up the movements a little bit for you, but his breaks, uh, you can see him resting here in uh, real time. Working through those pull-ups. Again, taking some, taking some breaks, looking at that bar. Is he going to go for another set? Just three reps there. All right, we're gonna move on from his pull-ups and go ahead to his wall walks. Oh, he's laying flat on his belly, shaking those arms out. Here he goes. Did a couple and he's taking another break. Guys, you get the idea here. <laughs> Lots of resting on the belly. Let's move ahead to that wall ball. So he's walking over, thinking about picking it up. going for five reps and he's breaking and guys it continues on like this through those 30 wall balls lots of uh breaks in between our sets of five so i do see uh some answers coming in on the chat box to what might be wrong with the design of this mixed modal circuit so just to give like a little bit of uh a little more information here as well it's an eight minute amrap and it took him like about six minutes to get through this list of exercises here I'm seeing a lot about, you know, too many reps, all upper body, upper, all upper body may be appropriate for the right person, uh, depending on what they built up prior. But yeah, a lot of, a lot of muscle endurance, like Brandon just said, Carl, what would you say is wrong with this prescription? Uh, outside of everything. Um, yeah, I would agree with every, with, every, with most of what people are saying. Um, Again, it's tough, right? Like we don't have like a, an avatar up where it's like Jacob's assessment, assessments are, are here. His goals are here. His capabilities are there. 
Um, but in general, with with uh, with a beginner, I think it's always beneficial to have a cyclical modality in circuits because uh, that localized muscle fatigue usually becomes too much of a limiter in a circuit format. And again, I'm not talking about a competitor. I'm talking about someone that wants to do, um, you know, metcons uh, for health, right? Or they're just like, hey, this is it's really fun. I want to include it in my uh, exercise program and I want to improve my aerobic capabilities. It's, it's, I wouldn't call it a rule of thumb, but I would, I would very, it's very unlikely that I would ever give work without a cyclical modality for uh, beginners that are trying to improve their aerobic capacity. Cool. Thank you for that insight. So guys, just a good little reflection on why it is very important to be deliberate with reps, with the exercises you select. And then of course, being all that being relative to the person you're writing it to, So we are actually going to move on and get into a few avatars now. So just to click ahead, we have our first avatar. And then guys, based on this information we present, we want to ask you which Metcon would be more appropriate. And we'll get to some different options on the next slide. So Carl, could you kind of read off who this avatar is and give us these important details? Uh, Yeah, like word for word? Uh, Yeah, if you want to, you can add your own flair in. All right, cool. All right, so we have Carol, not to be confused with Carl. Uh, Carol is 52 years old. Her goals are to live a long and healthy life and lose body weight, very, very common goals. Uh, training history, five years of CrossFit class, two years working with an OPEX coach, um, and then some movement pieces here. She failed her scratch test. She failed her squat. She failed her active straight leg raise, and she failed her side plank. Carol is an absolute mess. Um, OPEX work, she has, she accomplished 52 calories for the 10 minute max calorie assault bike test. Nathan asks, what's the scratch test? Uh, yeah, the scratch test is a test that, um, looks at our ability to get our shoulders into internal and external rotation. Um, so essentially just imagine seeing me from behind and going arm up and arm down and trying to touch each one of my hands or yep, touch each one of my hands. And then as a coach, you're just looking at the ability for the client to do that. When someone goes overhead, we're looking at their ability to externally rotate, get their humerus to vertical. When someone goes low, we're looking at the ability to internally rotate. And that has a lot of carryover in terms of uh, uh, what we can or, or cannot do an exercise based on that simple assessment. So guys, we've got a couple Metcons up on the uh, slide here. Workout A or Metcon A would be a 15 minute AMRAP at sustained pacing of a 10 cal assault bike and 10 cal row. And then workout B for time at sustained pacing. You guys are on it already. 40 calorie row, 30 burpees, 20 front squats, 30 burpees, 40 cal assault bike. (laughs) I'm seeing lots of very uh, emphatic A's in the chat box, guys. And uh, I think we're all on it. Austin, not enough burpees on B. So uh, guys, just wanted to really drive home the point that for gen pop, uh, especially with movement issues and maybe some restrictions and capability like Carol, uh, we want to stick with our cyclical, maybe mix cyclical pieces. It sounds funny and it seems ridiculous, but kind of like Carl had alluded to before, that's not always the case and what's always happening in gyms. And there is, you know, a lot of this kind of mixed modal metcon hit style training with activities like burpees and front squats that are giving, being given to avatars just like Carol. So not as like wild a question as it may seem. All right, let's move on to our second avatar. Again, Carl, walk us through it. Oh, I thought you were going to walk us through this one. No, you're on it. All right, so we have Bobby. Uh, Bobby's actually in the gym that we just went to uh, this past week. He's at OPEC CDA. What's up, Bobby? So Bobby is 29 years old. His goals are to stay safe and enjoy the challenge of mixed modal training as a way to stay active. So good opportunity to talk about that with Bobby and what that actually means. Uh, Training history, high school football, eight years of bodybuilding style training, four years working with a big dogs coach. Uh, OPEX move assessment, failed external rotation in the scratch, so lack of mobility there, um, and experiences pain pressing overhead. OPEX work assessment, Bobby is an absolute monster. He's gotten 190 calories over 10 minutes. 
All right, guys, we've got a couple options for Bobby. Let's uh, talk about what might be best. So workout A, we have five sets for time of a 250 meter ski erg, 10 dual kettlebell push jerks, 10 burpees, 10 dual kettlebell swings, 250 meter ski erg. And then workout B, we have very similar, but we have front squats in there. So guys, A or B, would love to know why you selected one over the other in the chat box. Yeah, looks like uh, everyone picked up on the scratch test, the overhead pain that he was occurring. So guys, glad you noticed that. Again, it may seem glaring and obvious, but I've certainly walked into and been in many gyms where there are people with shoulder issues that are pressing overhead in a metabolic conditioning environment. So just something we want to look for and always remember. And there are so many different versions of your bobbies out there and people with different limitations and restrictions. And it is very important in selecting exercises for Metcons that we consider that stuff. Carl, anything uh, you kind of want to add to uh, wrap up on your end before I give my little piece? No, I mean, as we're standing on our high horses, I've given, I've given shitty prescriptions like that to a guy like Bobby before. Um, not, not saying that to be funny, just saying it like, Hey, you know, no judgment. If you've, if you've been in that camp and you haven't considered assessing someone, uh, you know, maybe my assessment protocols weren't solid enough to catch things like that. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, I think that's reality for, for a lot of coaches, right? It's like, we're giving work that we're actually ignorant to the fact that that person shouldn't be giving that work. The thought, the idea of this, uh, this experiment and, and going through this is just to open everyone's eyes to like, Hey, there, there are systems in place that we can catch things like that. It's not going to catch everything, but it's going to catch those big mistakes that we've made as coaches in the past. Yeah, I have certainly been there too. And I also want to be clear that there's no one right answer, guys, when it comes to writing Metcons. And we have given you some frameworks today to be able to follow when it comes to actually putting Metcon design into place and writing workouts. But these are just two frameworks of so many that exist out there to help you arrive at what is going to be the best prescription for the individual client in front of you. So no perfect right or wrong answers. But ultimately, what professional fitness coaches, which is what so many of you on this call are, really want is not just to write the best Metcon or to write the best workout. It's to actually get the results from that workout for the client and to make sure that you're providing a lasting positive experience in fitness for everyone that you work with. And getting those results, it means more than just thinking about workout A versus B and what's going inside of those. It's really thinking about the big picture and making sure that what your clients are doing in the gym is also coupled with really solid lifestyle and nutrition practices. So I don't want to forget that stuff as we talk so much about exercise program design today. We have to think about the whole picture. And guys, that's why in the OPEX Coaching Certificate Program, which is our comprehensive flagship program, education and mentorship, we're not just looking at exercise. We are really thinking about the big picture, looking at assessment, at exercise design, of course, nutrition, behavior and lifestyle, and then the business principles and systems that the best fitness coaches need to know to get those clients results in the long term. As you can see on this slide, when you enroll in CCP, it's not just, you know, signing up for any program. You are getting a whole lot of online education through videos and textbooks. You're going to be on interactive cohort calls, kind of like this, but where all of our faces are on the screen and we can ask questions in person with Carl and with James. You'll get to learn and get your hands dirty during our digital immersion and doing practical case studies. You'll have access to our Coach RX program design platform and a year in our membership site with lots of bonus courses and ongoing resources and so much more, guys. So that is OPEC CCP. And we actually have our final cohort for 2021 that is enrolling right now. So there has never been a better time to start and become a professional fitness coach with OPEC CCP. So if you are ready to take that step and become a professional coach with OPEX, I'm going to pop a link in the chat box for CCP. All you need to do is go ahead, apply, 
and schedule a call to chat with an advisor. We can answer all of your questions and help you figure out if it is the best next step for you. Maybe you're not feeling sure if uh, CCP is right for you yet. You're not quite ready to take that step into professional coaching. We do have a programming principles course that is an introduction to the OPEX program design principles that's going to let you dip your toes on a deeper level into some of the stuff you learned today and also get into things like resistance training. And for the next 24 hours, we have a special offer to get 50% off that program. I'm going to pop the discount code in the chat box along with a link so you guys can go ahead and try out that course for 50% off for the next 24 hours only. If you are really serious about coaching, I know ultimately you're gonna to wanna to do CCP and I can see some CCP coaches in the chat box uh, egging everyone on. So thank you guys, I uh, promise we didn't pay them to say that. <laughs> but ultimately you are gonna to wanna to do CCP. But if you wanna start with principles first, dip your toes in, try it out, then we can go ahead and apply what you paid for that principal course to your CCP fees so you don't end up paying any more in the long run. And it's a nice little, you know, low risk way to try the education. So guys, again, check that chat box. I'll be dropping the links in there along with the discount code for principals. If you're ready for CCP and ready to take that next step in your coaching career, apply and schedule a call. Otherwise, take advantage of that 24-hour offer to get 50% off programming principles. We will also send these links out by email after. So guys, one more time, I'm just going to drop these links in the chat box here for you before we move on to Q&A. So uh, guys, start thinking about questions you might like to ask about Metcons and we'll get on to them. I do see we have a question uh, from Emily about the principal section and is it included in CCP? We do give CCP coaches access to our programming principles course, but CCP goes much further in depth around program design principles. So think about principles as an introduction and like a little bit of a tease into what you're going to learn in the full OPEC CCP program. All right, guys. When you're ready, go ahead and let's get those uh, questions in the chat box. There was one I wanted to hit on uh, much earlier. Uh, I think it was, I forgot who it was, but it was talking about, uh, I think the question or the thought was, I thought that aerobic work or Metcon should not include eccentric contractions. Um, oh, I thought that was it. Uh, so uh, that's kind of true. That's kind of true. Just think about it in terms of progression. So um, best practice is to include concentric specific contractions before you include eccentrics. Because when we think about the, let's just call it like the effect of going through a lot of eccentrics in a Metcon, uh, actually sustaining that work is a little bit tougher. Recovering from that work is a little bit tougher. Uh, so it's all about the intention and, and what you're doing in that Metcon. If the intention is to uh, come out of this thing tomorrow and be recovered, so you're using conditioning as a recovery mechanism, absolutely, yeah, take away eccentric contractions. And just so we're all on the same page, eccentric just means that we're going down and the muscle is lengthening in a movement. So think about like uh, going down in a squat, right? That's a very heavy eccentric contraction a squat is versus pushing a sled, which is a concentric only contraction, but they're both biasing the, the quadricep muscle. So um, at the end of the day, it's like, it depends on why you're doing it. If it's for recovery, yes, it is best practice to take out eccentrics. If it's not, and you're just like, hey, I'm doing mixed uh, Metcons, then it's like, yeah, why, why not have eccentrics if the person is able to sustain those eccentrics? I'm just going to quickly answer Ab's question, which is whether there's an age limit on applying for CCP. Um, Ab, no hard age limit. We would just want to make sure that you are set up in an environment to be successful. So I'd encourage you to apply and have a chat with an advisor and we can talk about your specific case to make sure you're, you're going to be all good. Uh, let's hit on Lewis's question, which is what do you think about programming accessory work in Metcons, for example, bicep curls? Uh... Sorry, say that one more time. I was reading something else. Sorry, Georgia. No worries. So what do you think about programming accessory work inside mm -hmm. of Metcons? Um, that, I don't think it's a great idea. 
Um, just because when we look at intentions, right, like the intention of doing a bicep curl is to uh, isolate a very specific muscle being an elbow flexor, right? Like that's the intention. And I would imagine that you're doing that at a fairly high volume. You're probably not hitting like a one or two rep max in the bicep curl. And if the intention is just to, you know, create a better uh, neurological connection from the upper to the lower extremity, um, then why not just do that before you do a, a Metcon or an aerobic piece? Um, there's just not a lot of really good carryover from doing uh, ski ergs and, and bicep curls. I, I get where you're going with that, but I think some people can take it a little bit too far uh, in terms of exercise selection in these pieces. I think those are better left in isolation by themselves because of the intentions on, on doing them. I'm going to quickly hit on Nikolai's question. He asks how deep we go into periodization and progression of Metcons over time in CCP. Uh, we go deep in, in that in CCP. Principles, there's a little bit of an introduction to periodization thoughts, but CCP is where we go very deep into periodization and long-term planning. And that's a very important part of the OPEX method and what a CCP coach would actually do as they're designing for a client. They're going to lay out long-term planning and then short-term planning inside of that. Uh, and then, you know, factoring in resistance and energy systems or metabolic conditioning uh, inside of you know different phases of training so long way of saying we go deep on that stuff let's go ahead and answer grant's question he asks would metcons be more age dependent or skill dependent let's say from ages zero to 40 after 50 or 40 i feel age becomes the limiting factor typically yeah, I think um, age and skill, depending on how long someone's been doing this thing, have a, a relationship that, that kind of goes together. Um, so as training age increases, uh, technically skill should also increase to a certain extent. And then we get to a certain part in our life gain uh, chart that James teaches inside of CCP. Uh, he called that the, the master, right? That we go from advanced to master. Once we hit that master stage, uh, things start to go downhill and we're resisting, we're resisting entropy or we're resisting going downhill. Once we get into that scenario, so think of someone, I'm just going to throw an age that we can all connect with, right? Like a 50 or 60 year old, they're definitely resisting entropy. Definitely. Right. So what they're doing in exercise is going to be different, all things being equal than what they were doing when they were 30 years old. Right. So you're on the right track. Yes, it does influence. Uh, it's a very lengthy discussion in terms of like, consider this, consider this, consider that. Um, and we lay that out in our life game chart in CCP. I'm just going to elaborate quickly on Nikolai, uh, who'd asked for an example around periodization. And I think how that connects to what someone might be doing in metabolic conditioning. So if we have someone in an accumulation phase, they're likely doing longer, slower energy systems or Metcon style work. Whereas if they're in intensification, it's possible they're doing shorter and faster work potentially even anaerobic work if they are an athlete that would uh, that would need that kind of unsustainable training. So uh, yeah, just a little example of how that might connect. What about Grant's second question? So Metcons before strength work or after strength work? Oh yeah, it depends. Um, you know, if you, if you execute a, you know, 30 minute uh, aerobic piece perfectly and sustainability that is there and, and uh, there's not a bunch of lactate buildup and you're not on the floor, yeah, you could definitely do accessory work after that, right? Those things aren't going to uh, interfere with each other. Um, inversely, you can do it prior to that piece as well, uh, depending on what you're doing. But an example of when you would not want to do that is let's say that you have uh, that 500 meter row interval piece that I, that I laid out before we started or at the beginning of this. So it was 500 meter row, 500 meters, rest two minutes times eight sets. Um, you probably don't want to do high volume deadlifting before that, because that will affect your ability to sustain the patterns that the row needs us to sustain to make that aerobic. So yes, you do have to think about interference and what you're doing in exercise and what that accessory work is. Uh, but it can interfere, but principally, if you do it, if you set it up in a way where the exercise selection doesn't have a, a vast amount of interference with the piece, yeah, absolutely do it. Uh, another example is the same setup and you're doing 
uh, you know, thousand, 1000 meter biker intervals, if you do a bunch of squat volume before, you're not going to be able to um, uh, perform those biker intervals at a pace that you could otherwise. So yeah, you just have to think about those things. What are your thoughts on isometrics in Metcons? For example, planks, wall sits, pull up holds. Uh, this comes from Naveed. Gosh, I hate to hedge and always say it depends on the intention, but it does, right? Like if it's if we're talking about a two minute uh, metabolic conditioning piece, and you're like, the goal is this, this, this rhythm turnover, all of that. It's like planking for one of those minutes, what happens, right? Like heart rate goes down. Yes, tension is high. You can get some really good stuff there, but heart rate goes down. And if the intention is to improve aerobic capacity, just do it before or after. I, I wouldn't do it in that piece specifically. But now we're talking about a 60 minute piece and you're like, okay, the goal is recovery. Uh, I want to get a little bit of isometric work. It's like, by all means do it. You just have to think, what do I want the dose response to be on this piece of work? If the dose response is not able to be met because you have isolation pieces inside of it, uh, then, then take them out. Uh, so it does depend on the, uh, the dose response that the coach wants. Let's go one more. So we've got Michael's question here. He asks, what determines the duration of the workout, i.e. number of rounds, length of the AMRAP? Yeah, what, what someone is capable of performing and what someone is capable of recovering from and doing it again tomorrow. Um, you know, I think that people should do higher volumes of aerobic work uh, and by aerobic work, everything, uh, everything being in play that we discussed earlier, right? So it's sustainable, blah, blah, blah. Um, higher volume, in my opinion, is always better um, for aerobic pieces. So yeah, I, I don't think that there's a such thing as too long or too short. You just have to ensure dose is being, is being uh, effective, is effective based on what you're laying out. The person's able to perform it. They're able to recover from it. And I know we always have this weird discussion on like, well, how do I do, you know, three 60 minute pieces in a day? Because no one really has time for that. Uh, but it's like, if they're training for something where it requires them to do that much work, there's really no shortcut around it, right? Like they have to do it, but most people don't have to do three hour aerobic sessions on a day. Um, I'm more thinking about performance, obviously with endurance, endurance athletes and stuff like that. We've got one more question. I know I said that was the last one, but we have two minutes. So we're going to answer it for uh, Angelica. So she asked, uh, can we do the same Metcon of full body three to five days a week? Or is it better to do different things each day, like upper and lower, depending on the day? Um, so I'm, I'm going to, and Angelica, I'm, I'm going to assume that by the same Metcon, you're like doing the same piece of work every day. Um, when we look at any exercise, whether that's uh, resistance, whether that's pacing work, whatever that is, the goal is to adapt to something, right? So if we do the same work three to five times a week, we may not see adaptation occurring because our body gets used to the way that we're doing that work, the effort that we're doing that work. There's, there is ways to progress things to ensure that you are adapting, but I would just leave it at that. Like, you have to ensure that adaptation is occurring, especially in metabolic scenarios. So the goal in metabolic scenarios isn't to get really good at patterns. That happens in resistance training. So what we don't want to see in Metcons is week one, 15 wall balls, uh, 25 calorie row, uh, 35 double unders times 10 minutes. And then week two, we're doing 18 wall balls. Like it doesn't work like that. The, the idea is to get a metabolic response, not like a localized muscle response that we would want to get in resistance training. And then, sorry, uh, second point of that question was separating it upper and lower dependent on the day. Yeah, I would think about that. I would think about how much volume you're putting into those, uh, into those Metcons, what you did the day prior, what you're going to do the next day, and if that fits really well in there. Because if you did do like a 10 by 10 squat session on Monday and then on Tuesday, you have air squats and wall balls and biker. It's like, that's probably not a great idea. You should probably bias the upper body a little bit more based on what you did the prior day. That's not because of adaptation. That's because of the, the amount of work and effort and sustainability that you'll be able to put into that session. 
So guys, we are right on time. We're going to wrap this thing up here. I have popped in again those links to apply to CCP or take advantage of that 24-hour programming principles offer. So please make sure you take those links down and that, uh, that coupon code there. And then finally, if you do have any questions that we weren't able to get answered today, our, chat our emails are in the chat box. So please reach out to Carl, reach out to me, and we can uh, make sure we connect with you offline, okay? Guys, thank you for joining us. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.